So James Clerk Maxwell is a Scottish mathematical physicist from 1831 to 1879. His most prominent achievement was to formulate a set of equations that describe electricity, magnetism, and optics as manifestations of the same phenomenon, namely the electromagnetic field. So he basically discovered the electromagnetic field. Yeah. Okay. His discoveries helped usher in the era of modern physics laying the foundation for such fields as special relativity and quantum mechanics. Okay, now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through this, this one or two slides really slow because this is important to get. Okay, so I'm just going to take my time a little bit here. <laughs> uh, but it's all right. We, we, we got time, okay? There are two types of energy systems asymmetrical and symmetrical. In his original work, The Dynamical Theory of the Electromagnetic Field, Maxwell identified two separate systems, both of which were completely different from each other. Yes. Okay, the first system is called an asymmetrical system, which is known as an open system, kind of like Maybe solar plants, solar yeah. panels, wind, power. wind, right? Those yeah. types of things, those are open systems um, that allows the creation of a series of exchange of energy reaction to our inputs based on electromagnetic resonance or electromagnetic feedback in every spin on a motor or in every pulse of input in a static coil. One of the first asymmetrical motors was Faraday's unipolar motor, later modified by Nikola Tesla. And these systems generate their own energy and do not require fossil fuels. Okay, so it just talks about how the system works. There's a second kind of system called a symmetrical system, which is a closed system that cancels the electromagnetic resonance with every spin, which creates wasted energy in excessive heat and requires an additional energy source to run, such as fossil fuels. These are the symmetrically obsolete systems that we use every day in all of our electrical appliances. Okay? Yes. So what we're saying here is the first system we're starting to get better because we've got things like solar panels and, and wind power and we're moving into that field. But for all this time, we have been using an outdated system. We've been using the wrong system. They built it so yes, that yeah. it would use gas. And they knew they could build it so that it didn't need fuel, fossil fuels. Yes, that's, that's right. right. It's all yeah. about money. It's all about money. Okay. Yeah. So now this is where the politics comes in. Okay, so we've got the two different kinds of systems, and this is what Maxwell described in his original mm. work, okay, after he died. Mm. One year after Maxwell's death in 1879, scientist Hendrik Lawrence, financed by J.P. Morgan and Thomas Edison, mutilated Maxwell's original work and spent the next two decades deleting all knowledge of asymmetrical systems that would not require the profitable oil industry to operate. They symmetrized all of Maxwell's equations, right? They messed with his equations, <laughs> and labeled these incomplete theories as the laws, laws of, of physics. physics. That you know today in your high schools, in your colleges, in your universities. Mm -hmm. Maxwellian equations were truncated yeah. um, and were what was assumed for those equations that now all systems, you can put a box around them and assume closed system, um, which is within the framework of the, of the law, fundamental laws of thermal, thermodynamics, closed systems. Right. So while the laws of physics, they do indeed apply to symmetrical closed systems of energy. All, right, all that outdated stuff. There is another set of laws 
There's a whole other set of laws, right, called the laws of nature, which apply to the asymmetrical systems that have been suppressed by the financial interests of the banking families for the last 130 years. This knowledge was banned from our education system, and no physics or electrical engineering school on our planet would ever teach about asymmetrical systems. Instead, the first and second laws of thermodynamics, which depend on the consumption of profitable fossil fuels, would conveniently prevail in our public knowledge base. Okay? So, chew on that one for a while, because that's pretty big. Um, so we're just, we're going to move forward with this though and keep spelling out the entire story. So basically the laws of physics, they only apply to symmetrical closed systems. Closed. Okay. And those systems, the laws of physics themselves, they're incomplete. Okay. 50% of the original concepts that Maxwell came up with have been, that's the 50% that applies to free energy and how free energy works. Not to be too confused, but Maxwell had a law of physics that were before that was a superset that include open systems. Right. So there is a body of work that is a fundamental laws of physics, but they include both open and closed systems. Right. So, so but everything that applies to free energy concepts in Maxwell's equations, they were removed from our public teachings. The open systems. By J.P. Morgan and Thomas Edison. And this is why you will never learn about this kind of stuff in engineering school. Okay. We're going to move on to the other set of laws that we talked about, which you might hear about it. We've got some really cool stuff to disclose here. Um, this is the laws of nature. Okay. So we've got these closed systems and they work. I mean, I plug my hair dryer in and it works, right? Yes. Does it work really well? Well, I know my electric bill is high, you know, <laughs> but it's like, um, how could it work better? I mean, like, why do we have to, like, just waste, waste, and consume, and consume? Why can't we just use what we've got? So, anyway. Okay. So we're going to talk a little bit about the laws of nature. Just, I know that my slides are running a little bit behind, so we're just going to keep talking, and you can follow along if you want on your own slides. Um, the laws of nature, uh, okay, so first of all, the laws of physics tell us that perpetual motion is not possible, mm -hmm. yet how does the earth rotate? Yeah. You know, ask yourself that, right? The laws of aerodynamics tell us that bumblebees are incapable of flight, yet how do they fly? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a big question. The conventional uh, scientists from all over the world will make statements such as, the claim that this is going to run permanently or indefinitely doesn't seem to hold because the second law of thermodynamics tells us that this is not, not possible. possible. <laughs> right? So around the turn of the century, the eminent British scientist Lord Kelvin said the following quote, radio has no future. Heavier than air flying machines are impossible, and X-rays are a hoax. So, so much for conventional science, right? The laws of nature contain concepts that focus on frequency, resonance, vibration, magnetics, and energy. A perfect example of this can be found in the aerodynamics law-breaking flight of the bumblebee. So we, before we get into the flight of the bumblebee, which is something that really made me like light up inside with an understanding of how this stuff works. Because again, I'm not an engineer, so I don't have the same brain that somebody like Tavon does. I, I don't see the energy working, but I kind of get a feel for it because we're all made out of energy. Um, what do you think about the flight of the bumblebee? And like, how, how can a bumblebee fly? I, I don't. I don't know. I mean, right? it's, it's yeah, so it's, much heavier it, it, it than its little like wings. It, yeah, and the way it kind of floats and right. Yeah, I just remember just hovering over a flower. I remember Ralph Ring was um, talking about how he was sitting in a classroom and his teacher was teaching him about all these laws of physics and how this is impossible. And then in that moment when he's learning about the laws of aerodynamics, um, he looks out the window and he sees this bumblebee flying and talking to him. And he's like, "Well, if," <laughs> but. 
the bumblebee do, is doing something that my teacher said was impossible. Um, so why is that? Hmm. So let's talk about um, the flight of the bumblebee. And this is really fascinating. And this has a lot to do with the way devices like the QEG work and some other yes. devices as well. Because yeah. we talk about resonance, right? Resonance is a vibration, like a frequency. So the flight of the bumblebee. Ralph Ring is an innovative technician who worked with Otis T. Carr, a direct apprentice of Nikola Tesla. In Ralph's presentation at the, Great, the Breakthrough Energy Movement Conference, Mr. Ring gives an amazing explanation of the flight of the bumblebee. And I'm going to read his quote from that explanation right now. Next to the larynx in the bumblebee's throat, there's a tiny hollow tube that acts as a resonance cavity that accumulates frequency when the bee starts beating its wings. It does this to accumulate frequency, which bounces back and forth in the resonator cavity until it reaches the same frequency of the earth, known as the Schumann frequency. Once the bee reaches the same frequency as its surroundings, it evens out into what is known as zero point. When anything reaches zero point, you can then change the energy. Okay? Mm -hmm. The bee is now free from the gravitational influence around it, creating its own little magnetic bubble, and it hovers around. And he says that there are some lizards and hummingbirds that do the same thing. And if you see the way a bee flies and the way a hummingbird flies, it's almost magical. Yes. Right? It, it, it's it seems different. To zip, zip it, you know, I've, we had hummingbird feeders for the longest time. Mm -hmm. And um, I would love when the hummingbird came over because it was a magical moment because yeah. it was, it hovers. Yes. It doesn't like sit there and, you know, exert tons of energy. The only reason why it's feeding those wings is to make something. Um, vibrate inside mm -hmm. so that it can help to change the field around it so that it can hover, mm -hmm. right? So I just thought that that was absolutely incredible. So the laws of nature and how they work, when you can tune something to vibrate at the same frequency as the earth and reach zero point, you are freed from the frequency influence of your environment and can then change the energy into anything you want, including levitation, or electrical energy. Once again, this comes from Ralph Ring's presentation, and there's some other people that talk about these concepts as well. Mm -hmm. And once again, you will not find this taught in schools no. because they don't want you to know this, right? So that's how things work. Um, this is how devices like the QEG works. Uh, Tesla's design causes the QEG to resonate so that it matches the frequency of the Earth, and in zero point, it changes the energy into self-renewing electrical energy. Okay, so that's one way of stating what happens with that. So there's a lot of people that ask the question, like, does the QEG work? Is it on or off or mm -hmm. whatever? And we say we're, we're tuning the device, and we're going to go into a big part of that in another show. But there's, it's, it's not a stop, start, yeah. on, off, clunky thing. This is we're working with a different form of energy accumulation and creation. So you have to tune it, like tuning a piano, like you got to, you know, get the, the knobs on the, the wires just so tight so that they resonate at a certain frequency, right? So anyway, all right, so we're going to talk a little bit about uh, government-funded research and higher education. And before we go into this, um, Tavon, if you can share a little bit about your training. You know, you were you were trained. Um, what was it like to go through the typical types of engineering training that exist that are available today in some of our major systems? Well, I mean, um, I guess in, in general, uh, depending on where you get trained, you have a certain amount of budget that's allotted to, as a student, to do research, to do work. Mm -hmm. Um, and so there's a lot of equipment, there's a lot of uh, tools, you learn how to, you know, you do proper measurements, you learn how to, uh, to, to properly take data, collect data, and to see how it correlates with any kind of um, whatever expected out outcome you might, you might see. Um, 
you have you have what you need to to fix a problem. Right, but it's um, did you? I mean, I don't actually. I never asked you this. Just kind of on the spot. But did you ever come up against any kind of like moment in your education in engineering where you saw something that was a little bit above and beyond what the teacher was trying to show you, and you asked a question that was probably a little too out there, and you were kind of told. We don't ask those kinds of questions here. Did you ever have any kind of experience? It's not really like we don't ask those kind of questions. It's just, just kind of dismissed as, well, that's just transients, you see. Right, okay. So, yeah, just, just curious mm -hmm. to know what your experiences were. But there are a couple people we're going to talk about here um, that had those exact experiences. And those, those just to bring out what it's like in these places. So you've heard the saying, follow the money. Right, and if you're in any field where it's it's science, it's education, um, it's energy, it's teaching, it's somebody who is an authority in a body of knowledge, they are an authority based on who's paying them to say what to make them that authority. Mm -hmm. Right. So in this case, government-funded research and higher education, most of the mainstream scientific research and higher education systems today are funded by government grants and corporate interests. Such funding comes with a set of rules and regulations that must be followed in order to continue to receive that funding, even if the rules are unreasonable. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you something from my own personal experience, because I actually worked in government for a while, and I was one of these grants administrators. That's very, very, very true. You can't get money unless you got um, unless you follow certain regulations. So somebody somewhere makes a decision, we're not going to teach this, and we're not going to experiment with this, we're not going to go this extra mile in this, whatever it is. Somebody makes a decision mm -hmm. to be closed-minded about a certain area of science, and if you're not getting funded for it, then they pretend that it's wrong, or doesn't exist, or they can vote science in and out of existence, right? We've seen that. We've got some ex examples of that later on, that voting. Yes. Um, saying science based on a vote, right? <laughs> so um, here's just a couple of examples. Uh, okay, Harold Ashburton has an honors degree in engineering from Cambridge University and is also the retired head of IBM's European Patent Division. When presented with undeniable proof of a perpetual motion machine designed by John Searle, he made the following statement. The government doesn't know about this work because the government only knows what their advisors tell them. Their advisors get money from the government and they want to keep getting the grants, so they're not giving the advice that they should from matters like this. Okay, so that's a quote, and you'll hear him say that. I have some links in here. Um, it's from a movie called The Machine to Die For, really great film yes, that highlights film. all of the unbelievable suppression that goes on in this field. Another example is going back to our friend Ralph Ring, lovely man, by the way, Ralph and Marsha Ring. Um, he was a, a lab technician in a government-funded research and development laboratory in Costa Mesa, California. And his job was to fire an electron through a magnetic field without deflection and to do it the way that they told him to do it. He was employed to repeat this experiment every day, which always failed, at a cost of about $10,000 per day, paid for by a government grant. He went home and replicated the experiment using the laws of nature and his understanding of them. And the experiment was successful, mm. okay, when he left and went yeah. outside of the lab. The next day, he took his results to the head of the Department of Advanced Kinetics, Dr. Weinhardt. And Dr. Weinhardt gave him the following response. I see what you're doing there, and I do understand. But, Ralph, what you don't understand is that this is a government-funded lab. And we're paid, we are paid to look for answers, but not to find them. <laughs> Just go back to work and don't say anything to the engineers. This is not to be talked about at all. Nothing to see here. Nothing to see here. Nothing to see here. Yeah. Right? So um, we're going to get uh, a, our clip ready. We're going to show you a clip in a, in a second. So, uh, Biggie, if you can go ahead and get the, the clip named MIT Graduates Cannot Power a Light Bulb with a Battery.
just a short three-minute film. We're going to look at this clip, and this this clip is golden. Yeah. Um, it's really golden because you sh you actually showed me this clip. I lived in I lived in um, Boston for a while, so I had friends at Harvard, and I was kind of like hanging around the Harvard MIT crowd and stuff. And you know, there's a lot of amazing stuff that comes out of those schools, but these are like the highest, most prestigious. Yes, um, yeah, universities is they're supposed to be the best of the best of the best, but sometimes you know there's not a lot of common sense going on, and there's a lot of closed-minded things. It's like you know, and I've heard that it's against the laws of physics. I've heard that argument a million times, mm -hmm. and it's like, well, I know that I didn't go to Harvard, and I'm not as smart as you, maybe, but come on, like, can't we just like have a cut? No, no, there's there's a definite script there, but this clip is great yeah. because it shows you. Um, some of the results that we're getting, um, and just before we go into it, the light bulb with the battery experiment that we're going to see, basically you can take a battery and a wire and a little light bulb, and you can get all three of them to work together if you understand some fundamental principles of electricity, right? Yeah. So you would think that MIT graduates would be able to understand fundamental principles of electricity. So, Biggie, go ahead and run the clip. Graduates of Harvard and MIT. The Massachusetts Institute of Technology. We are the premier engineering and science institution in the world. Do you think you could light a bulb with a battery and wire? Do you think you could light a bulb with a battery and wire? Yeah. Light a bulb with a battery and a wire. Maybe. Yes. Definitely. Do you think you can light a bulb with a battery and a wire? Battery and wire? Well, yes, why not? Okay. Definitely. Okay, can you do that? The interesting part about the batteries and bulbs question is that people always predict that they can do it. Students say, of course I can do this. And, uh, any hints I should have here? Teachers say, of course my students can do this. Oh! Do you know why that didn't work? I have no idea. Battery could be dead, the bulb could be bad, I'm hooking it up totally <laughs> incorrectly. I'm not an electrical engineer, I'm a mechanical engineer. But if I had to guess, I would say it's operator error. <laughs> okay. I know it's possible, but I don't know how to do it. It's only after failing that you begin to get upset with the question and think, well, maybe it's a trick question, maybe this has something to do with manipulating the wires, they couldn't hold all the wires together. You don't have a current if you only have one wire. You need a complete a closed circuit. But that's not the case. Oh, well, if I do it with a little light bulb, I just do this. <laughs> In which case, the, the light just lights up. It goes to the fundamental understanding of electricity. If one cannot light a light bulb with a battery and wire, then everything built upon those basic ideas has problems. We've always assumed that if teachers teach, students will learn. You can't assume that what's blatantly obvious to you and has always been blatantly obvious to you is going to be that way to somebody else, especially a kid. Uh, and uh, that's where you have to stop, regroup, and, and say, wait a second, is this really, is this really as self-evident as you like to think it is? Sometimes the simplest problems in science defy intuition and the most basic technology is surprisingly difficult to grasp. Is it because we weren't taught? Or is it because of something deeper? Something about the way we think. 